Hey, I'm Tom and I will be your host for the Reality Podcast. This podcast and the entire Reality Project is funded by Erasmus Plus and it's aimed at rethinking active learning and distance education. Now, in short, that's what means Reality. Now, this series is a three-part podcast diving into the evolving landscape of education with a specific focus on post-COVID society. In this first episode, we are going to take a look at the transition towards integrating new tools like virtual reality and online practicals, especially in the scientific disciplines. For this conversation, we gathered a mix of experts in the field, but also our team members from the project to ask well, a few different hard questions. Do these modern tools really compensate for hands-on experience that students get in class? Or can a virtual practical actually help students understand complex scientific concepts? Well, we'll hear some of the experts' success stories, but also the challenges in implementing these technologies, and we'll explore how these tools have been integrated, especially now past COVID, in boosting student engagement. Can these tools help prepare our students for laboratory work? Me, myself, I am a content creator and a science communicator, and I will also be the moderator of this conversation. So occasionally you'll hear me pop in to, well, probe for some deeper questions at the experts. And if you want to know more about our project, you can find everything that we published on our website, relday.eu, but you can also find all of our videos on our YouTube channel. The Real Day Project. Now let's round off this entire introduction and I think it's just really important to dive into all of the questions. So for that, I will let all of our guests introduce themselves first. Yeah, well, I'm uh, Leo Kühler. I work at the anatomy department of University of Maastricht um, and with the COVID, we started to do a lot of uh, online practicals. That was really the start point. And we did those both for histology and for anatomy. And for histology, those had been computer practicals before, so that was very easy. Uh, for anatomy, that was a bit more challenging, but nowadays there are a lot of 3D models available that are also interactive. And we tried to use material that's already available, or we built our own uh, databases we still use it because it has turned out to be um, very helpful as a preparation for students for the real dissection hall. So we use it more in a preparatory mode than as a replacement for the practicals, but that seems to be useful. Okay. Yeah, my name is Bin Lan Shi. I'm working at the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at Maastricht University. And... Um, yeah, I got involved also during COVID with a lot of online teaching. Um, but apart from that, one of the things um, yeah, that we struggled with was the practicals, of course, because the students were, first of all, not allowed to come to the university anymore. And then later on, they were limited. Um, and then how do you still train the students in uh, the best practical way so that they really can have like troubleshooting and life, well, feel like a life experience. Um, and for the Erasmus project, we actually chose to, well, me, I know Ariane has another topic, but we chose for the cell culture. Um, because not only because of COVID, but also to prepare students. So a bit similar to what Leo was saying, cell culture is, um, yeah, how should I say, not necessarily an expensive technique, but a technique where you have to work very clean. Uh, it's a very sterile environment. So in order to train the students before they enter a cell culture lab, we pick this one as uh, a useful um, practical. And uh, this will, yeah, be used in the future for bachelor students, uh, master students that are going to start an internship in our department. Yes, uh, my name is Nienke de Jong, and I work at the department Health Services Research, and uh, we do uh, research in elderly. But I'm also a member of the task force Instructional Design and uh, E-Learning. And what I do is I advise uh, colleagues um, in education, but in uh, digital formats. 
And uh, within my uh, modules, uh, we, we integrate, for example, flipped classroom. We integrated some uh, VR, think of 360 degree uh, videos. And um, yeah, I help others also, uh, for example, uh, cell, human cell in biomedical sciences, for example. And we help uh, them to use the VR glasses in that education. So I'm Ariane Vettorazzi. I'm a full professor at the pharmaceutical science department at the University of Navarra in Spain. So I do research in toxicology, in uh, basic and applied toxicology, but we also work under good laboratory practices for pharmaceutical companies. And so I teach uh, basically toxicology uh, for uh, undergrad and postgraduate students. So it's basic and advanced toxicology. And I'm also the director of a master in R&D of pharmaceutical sciences, where we cover all the development of the pharmaceutical drug from the very beginning, the synthesis to the marketing and, and so on. So from uh, my online uh, teaching experience, uh, as I think with, uh, for all of you, uh, I started teaching online because of the COVID pandemics. That was the starting point. So, but we have a nice experience when we change that because in our faculty during the lockdown, of course, we couldn't uh, teach face to face. But immediately after the lockdown, we started with a face to face teaching, but with a, a lot of social distancing, of course, and a lot of um, safety measures that so, that oblige us to change how we were carrying out our practical training. So. Basically, our experience there was like using some videos and virtual practicals before the students went to the lab. So like a preparatory tool um, before the real lab experience. That was our first point. And then in the RALDE project, I, I was involved in the dissection uh, virtual practical, which is a rodent dissection that I would like to to apply uh, in my teaching uh, at different levels, at undergrad level in a way that we can replace, well, not replace because we are not doing it with our students. We are not doing animal uh, dissection with our student at undergrad level. It doesn't make sense because we, we are not supposed to use animals with them, but I can show them how to do it. And then at postgraduate level, I can use it as a tool, a uh, very good tool, before sending the students to the real dissection. So they are really, really well trained uh, before they go to the lab. So it will be a, um, a replacement tool for replacing the lab um, practicals in undergrad level, but it can be a powerful tool for postgraduate students that need to be trained in animal dissection but they can uh, gain much more experience and save a lot of animals afterwards just because they're uh, better trained before they start with the, the real practical. So that's my, my experience. That's actually already a little bit of the first question. So I'm, I'm glad you, you brought those points up. But how do you feel that these tools um, can compensate? How can these tools like really improve the, the way that students learn these all these different practical steps because of course you're not doing it with your hands in in some of the tools so how does that transfer of information go according to you yes for me it's it's a kind of preparation eh? so uh, students are getting prepared and learn about the devices in a lab for example uh, and uh, this preparation is uh, really versatile um, because it, it uh, um, uh, can reduce time, but also safety uh, issues eh? can be um, yeah can be learned on forehand before going into the into the lab. And actually, um, when you also deal with uh, large uh, student groups, it's it's uh, yeah then you can immediately learn um, separately, but also uh, at the same time. So you do not need to have groups in the first semester or the second semester. So you can immediately learn uh, what you need to learn. And compensate, um, 
um, yeah, it's not compensating, but preparing, uh, but but it is not replacing. That should be clear. So it shouldn't be a replace of a real lab work. Yeah, we, we, we do two different things. One is really for the anatomy, we do a preparation, and that gives us the chance to show students already pictures of cadavers or of organs, so they get familiar with what, with what they're going to see, and they learn the terminology. Because usually they come to the dissection hall, they have no idea, and then we come with all this Latin terminology, which they anyway hate. And with these online preparation modules that we offer them, they, they are interactive, they con contain uh, rotatable 3D models, they contain a few pictures of cadavers, and they contain also interactive things where they can just click on, they get a multiple choice question, and they have to click on the right area, or they have to drag terms to the right field, or they have to answer one word questions. And then they see immediately how good they are doing. And then we have the feeling they come more prepared to class. And then we have for the first class, for example, a short uh, interview with the teacher where we ask them about the things that they learned and say, okay, now you have here a real plastinated heart. Show me the, the, the different items of that heart. So we, we already can start a conversation rather than that we tell them, and this is this and this is that. We have already a partner with whom we can discuss. The other thing that we do for the histology is we give them, in, in a PowerPoint file, we give them links to histological sections and say, give them some background information and say, try to find this structure, make a screenshot, paste that in your PowerPoint and annotate it with the terms that we already give you. So there's always one slide with background, one slide with a task. And then we invite them back for a one to two hour session with a teacher, 18 students in a group and say, uh, you had 18 tasks, who wants to present task one? And this way we make sure that they actually did the job or copied it from someone else uh, and that they are able to explain it. Yeah, Even if they copied it, they have to talk us through the slide that they made. So um, we think it's, it's more interactive and it also caters to their students' need of having something interactive and online rather than only a book. So it's um, in a way you have to somehow adapt like the way that you're teaching also to use the, to integrate the tool. It's, yep. And then how do we continue from there? I can imagine that's not always as easy. It's something, uh, a little bit of a trial and error as well, how it goes with students. Yeah, well, my, my what I learned is you have to really give students tasks. You cannot just say here you have all the material, everything is there, come prepared. It works much better if you give them tasks. I have to admit, though, that, for example, the medical program has a different approach because they think we just give students, we tell them, here's the material, and you, you start studying whatever you find interesting. You, you know what the end terms are, the, the definitive intended learning outcomes, and they are afraid if, we, if you guide them too much with tasks, that they will only do the tasks and nothing else. Uh, in biomed, we more have a slightly different philosophy. We say we give you tasks to engage the student, and then we see you later in class, and we see how you engaged. And I think both both approaches have their benefits. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. if I, I can give my, my opinion on that, um, our challenge after the COVID pandemic were how to start, uh, it was a cell culture lab with students that should be in the lab, but with a lot of social distancing. So what we did is uh, we, we did a set of materials, like the protocols, and then we prepared videos. Like what we were doing in, in our lab the first time the students were coming, the, the explanation about the principle of the test, the material methods, the experimental design, the safety measures before they start working in the lab. So this was a lot of theory that we were giving in the lab just immediately after the lab work, but we could save this time by uh, allowing the students to listen to our explanations with fancy videos that we, mm -hmm. we did that were uh, appealing for the students. So we realized that the, uh, uh, the students were coming to the lab much more prepared 
they were they they were just sitting uh, willing to start the experiment instead of sitting just waiting for us to tell them what experiment to do and how to do it. I mean, so uh, it worked very well, and we keep these small groups because they work much better in small groups in the lab. We don't spend mo more time with them, but it's much more effective. So this was uh, something that we we changed be because of a, a safety measure during the post-pandemic period, but it, it works much, much better. Yeah, no, I, I agree with uh, Arlian, but uh, a tool that our university has started using more and more is called LabBuddy. And um, it's a bit similar. So yeah, also uh, the same here during COVID and post COVID, we also were smaller groups in the practicals, but indeed preparation, um, the LabBuddy tool offered us to do that. So what LabBuddy does is that they actually have to prepare the practical, they have to connect the steps. So they're like blocks of the protocol, let's say that they have to connect in the right order what they have to prepare, what they have to do. And we also can include what we call an entry test. So which makes them, well, they get questions and can be either multiple choice or some open questions or like what Leo said that they have to rearrange uh, steps uh, like drag and drop. And they have to think about, first of all, safety, yeah, because in the first year, these are the GLP practicals, so the good laboratory practicals. There, they really have to prepare this. And then they already start thinking, OK, how do I behave in the lab? So they do that up front. And when they then come in the lab, we do go over not all the questions, but usually we discuss in group a bit. We ask, were there any doubts? So it's similar to what Leo was saying. They prepare up front and then in group, we go over them to make sure everything was clear before actually starting the practical. And similar to what Ariana has experienced, you see that most of the students, there are always students that indeed copy from each other, but most of the students seem more prepared uh, and they know then what they're going to do rather than just uh, having a PDF or a document somewhere that they were supposed to read. But with these interactive online tools, you really make them solve them. And we call it entry test because they have to solve it. Otherwise, they don't get entry to the lab. So they really have to do it. But it's in a playful way that they prepare themselves. Uh, and I think this is something that is used more and more now after COVID and really shown to be very successful. Yeah. And actually, we would like to extend this. Eh? So uh, this is virtual at the uh, computer via the laptop. We, but we would like to do it with the VR glasses. And with the VR glasses, if you make it like this, that you can walk uh, in the lab, then it's, it's um, even more realistic. Uh, so that, uh, that would be really nice. Eh? So being in a lab uh, and doing things with the different machines and walking to the machines and to use the machines like um yeah like normal actually that's actually yeah. actually something that i was really interested in because um i have a background in video and like i'm really interested in everything that's very innovative and very immersive and i think that's the thing that vr can provide for uh for the new new generation of scientists in a way um but how do you start thinking about a practical in a VR setting? Because, of course, it's a lot of different things you have to think about. It's not only um, how do, what's the world building that we're doing. Are we telling a story here? Or is it just very, very dry and very sick of like, hey, this, um, this is just a practical? Is there a gaming element to it? How do you start thinking about, like, let's design a new, new practical? That's that's a really broad question, but uh, we started uh, with a question uh, because I was uh, uh, having here a kind of conference with VR glasses and one of my colleagues said, oh, it should be really nice to travel in a human cell with the glasses. Okay, so we did that uh, and we started the project, etc., etc. But then another colleague said, hey, oh, but uh, be in a lab and doing things, that would 
also be really nice. So, and that was the point for searching a kind of um, firm who who can build this. And um, yeah, so uh, but then is the question: What are we building? Uh, what kind of practical now cell culture now you have different parts of cell culture so we cut it in different pieces uh, and i'm not from the lab or i'm i'm i have nothing to do with uh, biology um, but what i did is i went to the lab and walk with um, a colleague uh, walk along with the different step in culture the cell culture so we made all kinds of documents uh, and we sent it to different firms uh, from okay what can you do with it um, can you make um, a kind of game or um, can you can we organize it uh, which is quite real etc now two firms said okay we can do it and we chose one company and we are still discussing how to do it because it is a really big big job so we would like to start with a really small part and um, a small part in the sense of a, a small part of cell culture and explore this and uh, develop this first and then maybe continue. And you asked us from, okay, is there a kind of gamif gamification? Now, what we would like to do is that we can follow students, how far they are, how quick they are, how many uh, uh, mistakes they make, etc. So, so you should think about a kind of underwater screen so that we can follow students. And that would be really nice. Um, yeah, and gamification, yeah, we are not that far. Uh, so we are now uh, thinking about, okay, do we get the money and uh, can we explore things and make it a, re a realistic part of the cell culture? That's indeed very nice. If I, I can add something because one of the big advantages that I see when we use these kind of tools is that we can show the students the real workflow or the, the complete processes and then stop whenever we want to go to more in-depth details in some of these steps. But we work like in modules, just that you can go to the general view and then stop at one point. But normally when we go in the lab, we are just showing them a procedure, a specific procedure, but there is a whole workflow before this procedure. For example, when we teach like an cell viability assay in the lab, we're just giving them the plates with the cells already seeded, but you have to culture the cells, you have to keep the cells, um, uh, do the cell passages, you have to seed these cells in the plate, and this is something that they do not know how to do it, or they just know it uh, because we, we explain it in the text, but they are not able to visualize that because they don't see the cells, they don't know even where the cells are sometimes. So with the virtual reality, you can teach the students all these entire process that we normally are not able because to do a cell passage takes 30 minutes, but we cannot have 30 minutes one day, one student, and then another day, other students. So we cannot keep the cells alive with the students, but they can see the entire process and then stop in the procedure. We want them to gain some skills and do it in the lab, but you can show the entire process. And then you can add and grow. So what, what Ninke was saying, it's like the amazing thing is that you can add modules and steps or as, as much as you want. So that's the, the big thing about this virtual reality as a tool for students. Yeah, maybe I can also add on to what Ninke was saying, because I was also there when we first experienced the how it is to be in a cell. And so we are indeed using that now in biomedical sciences. And I think, okay, gamification is maybe something we can grow to, especially for cell culture. I think it would be useful to let them experience what can go wrong and, and where they have to troubleshoot. But for being in a cell, I think there... It was a whole experience, at least my student group was very amazed and it gave them another perspective of how 
cell organelles, for instance, also interact because they, of course, on paper, they see, and in a textbook, they see, okay, we have all these organelles and this is the function and so forth. But then how they move towards one another and, and how they interact with each other, I think that was really nice to see. Also, even for me, I mean, it was like, wow, it's another perspective that you have then. So I see VR also in one hand to give you a better global or overview of, of the whole theory rather than uh, just in text and, and, and just summing up facts. And then hopefully in the future, we can indeed move to more experience. So yeah, it's two types of learning goals. I would say you have like the biomedical knowledge we, we usually say, or the knowledge learning goals, they can be achieved. I think with the tools we have at the moment, like online tools as well. If you really want to focus more on the learning goals where they really acquire skills and experience, uh, then I think these gamification elements are going to become more and more important. Yeah, there's just so many thoughts running through my head actually at the moment, because like as we already talked about, COVID was such a catalyst of, of defining new tools, finding new tools, adapting our teaching styles as, as teachers. Um, we have the VR, which can be very immersive, but can also be just as a, you can also just play a movie and just have people watch it and be immersed in that way. So it's less focus on activities, but it's just focus on what's coming into the screen. Um, but as well, I think it just depends on like when, at what point do we decide to use this kind of tool? At what point do we use a tool, for example, as, um, as Leo is working on? Um, how do you define that like with the learning methods and uh, the learning goals like where do you think of like hey this might be something good here how do we define that how do teachers have to adapt to to use these tools because of course that's not easy as well are there some thoughts running around that no maybe when i can start um uh, when i uh, look at my innovations and most of my innovations come from the teachers themselves so there is something missing and then we are or missing or not working properly and then we are checking is is for example vr something or is a clip or something else um, reasonable so it's um yeah for me, it's from the work floor, as you can say it like this. I, I totally agree because I'm on the other side. I'm normally the teacher that, you know, sometimes you know that something is not working. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that they are, you are giving information, but they are not picking this information or they are not using. So this is a moment to say, is the tool I'm using to teach this the correct one? I think this is always the, uh, the way. And for me, for example, for uh, VR, um, it can be something very important when you want the students to be more auto autonomous and more proactive as well, because uh, they have to work beforehand and they will have to work also on a different timing. They can use it whenever they want or whenever they need it. I mean, so you, you are just giving the center to the students. So that is uh, one of the big things uh, is uh, for me is I start using, I will start using these things just because I want them to be more autonomous and more proactive in their learning and not me giving information and then repeating what I'm saying. I mean, that not, doesn't make sense, but there are always tools because on the other hand, I do not agree with people that tend to use these fancy tools just because they are nice to see or they are beautiful and that is a big mistake from my point of view it's not you are not teaching better just because you are using these innovative tools no you have to use them when you need it because sometimes what you need is the classical teaching at some point for example there's no replacement when you want to gain skills in an animal dissection you cannot replace 100 percent if you want them to become skilled in animal dissection because i cannot teach them the pressure they have to to use when they're using a scalpel, I not I cannot tell them how to use the forceps correctly because it's slippery or it's, it's not as clean as in the images that we are using for the VR. So, but of course it can replace for some 
students that I know that they would never need to use this animal dissection, for example. But they really need, for example, it's like in pharmacy. I would say the 90% of the pharmaceutical science students are going to the hospital and the community pharmacy. So they do not need to do an animal dissection. But they are the but they know the the medical drugs. They know that the safety and the efficacy should be tested in animals at some point. So th- I I want them to learn that to see that. But I don't need them to be skilled at the dissection. They I, I they don't need to handle the animal. So in this case, you can use the VR as a replacement, because I I don't want to use animals or we are not allowed for ethical issues, of course, to use animals for students that they are not going to use this skill in their professional lives, but I want them to know it because the safety and efficacy of the pharmaceutical drugs still relies a lot in a lot of in vivo studies. So I think that, uh, yeah, you have to use it them whenever you need them, but not just because a game, it's nice or it's entertaining for our students. We are always have to be thinking about the learning outcomes. That's my way of thinking. I mean, I saw Leo was also agreeing with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, I said that we introduced a lot of things with COVID, but that's actually not really true because the, the lab duty, for example, we already started before COVID. And one of the issues was we had uh, so-called independent lab trainings where we said students should come to the lab and be able to repeat an experiment that they did before teacher guided and they should be able to do it by themselves. So it was a slightly modified experiment and we gave them a a paper manual to prepare and then they got stuck at the first calculation that they had to do and they didn't continue and they said, yeah, I I don't understand how to do this calculation and then we spent the first half hour or even longer of the practical with explaining how to do the calculation and then very often individually to five times over or ten times over. And when we introduced the lab body, we could say, you have to do these calculations, otherwise, and for each calculation where they got stuck, if they gave the wrong answer two times, the program would automatically give them some help. It would say, you probably did this and that, but please remember the formula is this, I try again. Um, and sometimes you could even give two or three uh, hints in a way. And then we said, and this lab buddy, once you've built your your Uh, scheme of what you're going to do, each uh, tile or each uh, step that you add has a question associated with it. And you will only be allowed to the practical if you have answered all the questions and we give you instantaneous feedback. And that worked extremely well in the first two or three years. And now we see that there is a certain fatigue because we use it now not only for two practicals, but for the majority of them. And then they start to to copy and paste because students are also efficient and they think, okay, I have to prepare three different practicals. I only have time for one. So I copy one, one I won't do and see whether I can get in anyway. And uh, one I will prepare properly, something like that. And I think for the anatomy, it was similar. We, We had the feeling students did not come as prepared as we wanted. And so we said, okay, we give you a short entrance exam of 10 questions. Very simple, not not something uh, uh, very complicated, but if you've read the introduction, then you should be able to answer them. And what we see now is that students go back to these questions directly before the exam or to these preparation manuals because they have a feeling that gives them a good start to to do their repetitions before exams. So I think it's more useful than than we expect, although it does not always work the way we want. And the consequence was actually when we saw how much difficulties they had with calculation, um, we also developed uh, with uh, Herman Poppe, we we developed a calculation tool where students can learn how to do chemical calculations. And the better they become, the more complicated the questions become that they get. And if they do the effort, they can very easily pass the calculation exam that we do at the end of the first study year. If they don't make the effort, they will probably still struggle. So it comes, as Ninke said, and also Ariane, it comes from a need that we observe, and then we use the tool. It's not that we think we need the most fancy tools, and then 
education will work by itself. It doesn't. <laughs> Imagine that would be a very easy <laughs> way of teaching, yeah. right? Now, something you said is also really interesting to me, and that's um, like we always talk about these tools and like the, the future and like could be really interesting, but um, you also, really, also already mentioned a little bit of a drawback in like uh, the fatigue from the students. Are there some other disadvantages of using tools like this that you have to think about before starting? Do you maybe have like you can design your course around that so to to mitigate uh, these disadvantages? Maybe I can start on that. Um, so yeah, again, linking to the lab buddy tool that we're using, but it can be also another online tool. Of course, for the students, it's also a new way. So like what we said at one point, also like you can't just tell them like, here it is and just go. Um, so what we actually do is the first year, the very first course, the bachelor students get guided through it. So that's also important to really guide them into these tools. So actually the very first practical for us is still on paper. They get similar entry questions, so similar questions that they have to Google or they look into the lecture that I, I gave or another material that they have been provided, but they look for answers and they write it on paper. And then we tell them and we instruct them in a lecture like, okay, this is now how you're going to use a tool instead of answering the questions on paper. They're going to be more interactive questions calculate calculations we're also at what i said safety or thinking about uh, how to dispose of certain chemicals in the lab and then you guide them into this system and we give them also feedback so when they come to the door of the lab we really check like that you do it in the right way if not during the practical we troubleshoot with them so it's also important for the students to guide them in there and yeah the Wi-Fi or the internet connection is, of course, important there as well, because then what they do is they bring their preparations to the lab. And what we sometimes see there, well, first of all, they have the laptops in the lab. So you also need to provide space in the lab where they can safely put a laptop. So now in our labs, we have these laptop stands over the bench, let's say, out of the area where they work. Um, but also, yeah, the internet connections. Uh, sometimes students say, ah, oh, we cannot access our preparations because my Wi-Fi is not strong enough. So this is, of course, a bit the downside of, of these technologies, although often it's also that students need to prepare a bit better for these things. But you see it becomes better when they get to a certain level. Uh, but you need to guide them through this and, and prepare them for these uh, extra new tools yeah i want to add something uh, uh, th there because when i talk about vr glasses that's a totally other uh, business of course eh? so we have glasses here and these glasses these these vr glasses need to be updated each time so uh, that's something uh, i have 35 glasses here uh, plus so i have to update them and maybe in one year or, uh, or two years, there is a new VR glasses, which is better. And the apps should work on these glasses as well. So there are uh, different issues that you think about or you have to think about these things. Eh? And um, yeah, uh, do I need uh, Wi-Fi using um, uh, VR glasses? Is it with uh, many students or is it one by one? Uh, do I need a, a large room or a small room? Are students coming in or are the glasses at the library? So there are different aspects which we have to talk about it and discuss how to organize this. We have a similar problem. We use a lot of uh, internet websites, not all our own, especially for the histology. Links change. Or um, suddenly the, the way the programs are written changes. Or students come, we have prepared everything for, let's say, a normal Windows computer. And for Mac computers, the commands are different. Or they use a different browser. And with one browser, it works. And with the other, it doesn't work in the same way. So you even if you're a teacher of histology or anatomy, you suddenly also have to become quite good at computer science uh, and be aware what does a Windows computer do, what does a Mac do. Then there were these terrible Chromebooks where, or Google, yeah, 
with where hyperlinks suddenly didn't work anymore. So you had to give the student a whole list with hyperlinks separately of the file. So I think in a way it's nice because we as teachers are also challenged and we constantly learn something new from that. I agree with that. I was um, another challenge I see in the is in the design of the VR as well, because might at least for me I'm 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 not going uh, working with uh, this VR glasses and but it's also uh, the level of difficulty uh, you are because if it's really easy I mean or really straightforward I mean you are going to lose the brilliant students. But if it's uh, also, it depends on how you know if it's uh, glasses, but if you're in an in interactive tool, when to decide to tell the student to retry again, retry again, and when you give the correct answer or a tool to get to the correct answer. Because if it's really easy, you lose the brilliant ones. If it's really hard, I mean, you lose half of the class. So this is a point that it's difficult to achieve because it's an equilibrium uh, um, when they have to give up. I mean, and students are really quick also with computers. So they might also just use like a, a error true tool. I try this answer. It doesn't work. I try the other and I'm not thinking about it. I mean, this is something they, they can do very easily. And this is something that I would like to avoid, but I don't know how to do it. Because, uh, yeah, I tried this first answer, it's not the correct. The second one, the third, and the correct one will come. So they are just memorizing the results without thinking. And this is something that you think they are avoiding because you are using this tool, but it's not true. Uh, so that is my challenge uh, as a professor when I design these uh practicals. And I, if you have some tips, uh, I, I'm more than happy to hear them because this is the key point, the mission. When to allow the students to give up or, or not. <laughs> I, I had a very similar uh, problem recently. I had a mentor student and she's in the third year. And then I, I asked her how, what she learned, what she likes, where she wants to go. What she doesn't like the lab. And then I asked the uh, why not? And then she said, because she she doesn't really understand what she's doing there. And then I said, yeah, but that's why we introduced Labody, where you build your flow diagram self, yourself, your steps. And then she said, oh, yeah, but I just drag the tiles. And until, when the program tells me this connection doesn't work, then I try another one. I don't even think about it. And <laughs> I was completely shocked because I thought, we, we give you this nice tool to help you, and, and that's the way you use it. So what I've done now is I have a ship project where I have a group of students and I say, okay, I hear very different complaints about the lab, about LabWordy. I want you to go and interview students and I also want you to think about solutions. And I think that the students probably understand better than me. And, and so we will have, a, I think, 16 or 20 week project in which I hope that these first year students uh, together with me that we will come up with with solutions but i already know all solutions that we will have will work for two or three years and then it's time to do something new that's true but that's yeah. all in any teaching i would yeah. say <laughs> yeah there's actually something we also stumbled upon in the podcast of uh, bbl so we already recorded one uh, about problem-based learning how do we measure success i think that's a really good question i don't know if you have any ideas on that like when do we feel like students are successful in using this tool when do we know that they um, mastered the, the material that we want them to to learn yeah that's that's a really difficult question um because often these uh, tools are used uh, in a very specific way for a really small small part of the module for example and yeah, measuring, uh, we measure, for example, motivation, students are satisfied, they're happy with uh, using these uh, tools, for example, but um, we, or we didn't do a uh, research in which you can compare. So that's our future, huh, that we uh, do some research in uh, the old way and, for example, the new way, and then compare. 
and then uh, focus on the learning strategies and the outcomes of the different um, groups. But for now, it's uh, yeah, difficult question. I agree that it's a really difficult question because sometimes also it happens that some tools might work with a group of students and not work with the other and the others the other way around. So in terms of success, the percentage of your student population, it's the same, but you are just succeeding with one kind of students and not with the others. So even if, if you compare numbers uh, and you go in that and you know your students, I think when teaching, you really need these uh, face-to-face -face interaction with the professors. And sometimes I don't need to do a test to know that they are succeeding. I know because I know how they are interacting with me. And, and yeah, and this is, I mean, we are humans. I mean, you see that they are understanding a little bit more than what you are expecting from them. So, I mean, it's difficult to compare with numbers because you, you, are, you will have always a bias because we have uh, huge groups of people that learn differently. So this is why I really like to have a combination of, teaching methodologies. This is why it's nice to have different professors with different styles of teaching and so on, because uh, I think there's no a unique way to do it. I mean, it's like a combination of science, technology, and art as well. I mean, teaching is an art in some way. So I think it's a combination of uh, these things, and I think that we have to try, and when you are teaching and you enjoy your teaching, I think you are always innovating. I mean, you can innovate without tools as well. You can just innovate with yourselves on how you, you ask questions and so on. So it's always depending on the needs. And sometimes you also change tools depending on the group you have. Because I teach in Spain, but I did my postdoc in the Netherlands, in Maastricht. Uh, so I know that you're a university. And sometimes there are things that work very well with Dutch people that does not work very well with Spanish people because there are different societies, different ways. I asked my students in Spain to evaluate or to assess each other. It, did, it didn't work at all because they were just mixing relationship or friendships, relationship with the assessment and it doesn't, and, and it works perfectly in the Netherlands. I mean, so sometimes you have to, to change also the methodology depending on the students you have. It's not the same medical uh, students than biomedical science students is not the same. Uh, the people that have decide to become a medical doctor is a different uh, profile of student as well. I mean, so you have to teaching the same subject to different populations and with different ages, you have to change the tools and you have to change each three years like Leo told because they learn from each other. But also learning from others is good. I mean, <laughs> they have collaborative works. So, I mean, it's difficult questions that we have to, to deal as teachers, I would say. Yeah, and I think it's not only the, the wide variety in students, because for, for one, the, the good students will work very well with, with all kinds of exactly. tools and options that we give them. But it's also, it depends so much on, on your you as a teacher. I mean, if I have four practicals in a day and I come in very enthusiastic in the first and maybe still very lively in the second, I may be a bit tired uh, in the third and I may be completely exhausted in the fourth and then you, you have to be an actor. And if I'm not in the mood to ask engaging questions and give the same answers 10 times in a row and, and that over four practicals, then the student engagement will also go down and if i just give them a tool and i don't think about ways to integrate it into my teaching and and to ask them about it and to show that i care whether they used it or not it will ma not make a difference so i think the the personal engagement also as a teacher that they know you and that they know you care whether they used it or not makes makes a huge difference so i, I sometimes do even weird things where I think I'm, I'm a bit crazy. So I check their preparation on the online website because I can see whether they did it. I put a green dot in front of their name. Um, I don't do anything with that, whether they prepared or not. But just 
that they know I have looked at it and they will come afterwards and say, but I want to show you I did it. Maybe I did it a bit late. But just this little green dot gives them the feeling that we actually look at what they're doing. And if I don't put the green dot, then they think, oh, yeah, nobody cares. So so why should I? I would say that it also depends on, on yourself because sometimes I didn't need to change, but I just wanted to do because I was getting bored of teaching the same subject for 10 years in the same way. I mean, it was working, uh, but I was starting to get bored myself. So that is a very, very problematic. I mean, because you, you lose enthusiasm. So sometimes I just change things because not because of the students, because they need it. It's because I need it to refresh myself as a teacher. So sometimes uh, you, you ask me why, and it's just, well, I was bored to teach it this way for 10 years. I need to change because I need to be present with my students. I need to enjoy. And I think they also need to enjoy. And if you enjoy, I think they also enjoy. So I, the word is like enjoyable uh, to learn and to teach. So what I hear, it's like a little bit of interpersonal skills. Um, you have to learn how to adapt with the with the students itself, but also maybe some self-knowledge of like how you feel about the teaching and how how you've grown as a teacher yourself i mean i can imagine that if you, you you're not only teaching the same things for te 10 years you've also grown as a person and like really understand the material and, and you have to find a way to to share that uh, enth enthusiastically i have like a few last questions to ask but i want to give ariane and sabine actually and also um nink and leo the chance. Are there any other questions that you feel like you really want to ask uh, to each other before I ask any other questions? Yeah, perhaps I have a question because I think in uh, your university you are very good doing this. So how many people do you, because yeah, you are a teacher from one subject, uh, but when you, you are setting up a, a neuro VR practical, how many expert, different expertise apart from the one you are teaching you need? So how many people from the IT services or you, Ninka was talking about a company that was doing uh, some part of the job, of course, because we are not, uh, from a technical point of view, able to do this. So do you have examples, uh, for example, that you can share with me on how many people or how many expertises you needed to set up one of these new methodologies? That is also a very difficult question because we are in the early phase of preparing a lab. And you see here in the Netherlands, we, it, it, it's coming up. So last uh, week I had a meeting with uh, medicine uh, educators uh, also involved in VR. And they said, oh, it's like the 80s when um, Internet is coming and everyone is starting up their things. It's like VR, XR, AR. It's, so, yeah, a technician is very uh, important. Uh, also, um, during this conference, uh, they said, oh, we have some spare people, and they call it amanuensis. I'm not sure the English word, but um, an extra person who is uh, handing uh, out and handing in the, the VR glasses. People for do, also for doing research had to build a kind of uh, knowledge. Yeah, maybe also uh, the one that Nick uh, is now making on the cell culture, where we also assisted a bit. So if you really want to design one yourself, you have to think about, okay, how does it look like in the lab? Eh? So that's why she came to our lab. One of our cell culture technicians showed her the different steps. So you need an expert or a technician to to actually demonstrate and then a biological expert together with an educational expert, I would say, to write down, okay, how are we going to design this? Um, but yeah, in our university, we have people like Ninke that get room to, to do this, to assist in designing uh, new tools. Actually, on um, university level, we are busy with organizing this. Eh? So uh, each faculty, for example, got 15 MetaQuest 2 glasses. So that's the first start. And on the other side of the, uh, the river here, uh, they started a lab as well. 
and we have a, so, a community building. So we meet each other um, uh, many uh, several times to talk about how um, are you doing this and what kind of VR are you doing? Uh, for example, I do a lot of 360 degree videos. So we develop these videos ourselves ourselves with a media uh, company, but also with experts from other uh, institutes, for Applied Science uh, Institute, for example, or a care institute eh, to make these clips properly. Eh? So experts are uh, very important as well. Eh? Yeah, But at university level, we are uh, really busy and also nationally. Uh, last July, we had a meeting in a city and all kinds of different universities came to show uh, what they are doing this XR, VR, AR, etc. You already mentioned like with video and I think that's also that Leo is um, a little bit more working with. Um, if you're working with visuals, of course you have to have, you have to know the materials, you need to know, you have to have the experts who know the, the knowledge that actually has to be transformed. But you also need somebody who can capture the visuals in, in a certain way. Um, do you? How do you do that, Leo? Is that somebody from the team? Is that somebody you you get involved from third party? Um, and that's very different. I mean, for example, for our histological sections, we did those ourselves a long time ago, mm -hmm. and then we scanned them, and, and now we have them with the web viewer. For, for the web viewer, for example, there you again need some expert, someone who tells you, which web viewer to use, for example. Um, so, so the images we we essentially make ourselves. We now have an interesting problem. We also reconstruct as part of PhD products uh, development, the development of the heart, for example, through, through different stages of the embryo. And then we have interactive 3D models, but how do we get these to the students? Because the format that we have them in now is um, much too slow and inconvenient uh, to get it to all student computers. And now we have uh, found someone who is actually into animation and gaming as a student. He sits in France and a professor here in Maastricht said, go to that student. And now we have him as an external who's working for us. And he's writing a program for us where we can uh, import our 3D structures into a simpler program. And then we can show it either on a 3D screen where it really looks like 3D but he is also going to make a version for us that will work on every student's home computer so that they can turn the 3D models, kick parts of them on and off. And then our task will be to write assignments to engage with these models because, we, as we said before, just giving them the models won't work, but giving them assignments where we say, follow this structure over time um, and describe it or something like that, and then make that part of the tutorial but we need external experts for that. That we can't do. So if I if I if I have to recap that, it has to be an educational team, somebody who des develops the materials. It has to be some kind of a media team mm -hmm. um, of figuring out what are the visuals we're making, yeah. how do we capture these visuals, whether that's 360 video, whether that's something else, and then of course an IT team, um, somebody who can then take all of that bundle it together in some kind of program and application that can be used through the glasses, through the computers, through the phones, but just as an online tool. Yeah. I have to say that would be the ideal world. The real world is <laughs> <laughs> the real world is that we do a lot of it ourselves. And, and then sometimes you are lucky to have someone in your department who said, yeah, I know someone who has made an app or I, I know you can import this in an online program and that student can then download. So we do also a lot of it ourselves just because we we are enthusiastic. What's the resistance there to not do it the, the ideal way? Is it um, a question of funding? Is it a question of not knowing these people? What the, What's the resistance that you feel? When I go to our ICT department, first of all, there is not one department, but there are several different uh, people responsible and I've asked in different places and for example just storage space for models or for, for pictures and then nobody is really responsible uh, or you, you get a storage space but as soon as you say this needs to be accessible not only to students from our faculty 
but since we work together with other anatomy departments mm-hmm. also for the rest of the Netherlands, or we want it even to be accessible worldwide or Europe-wide, mm-hmm. then there come a lot of security issues, and the guy who initially was willing to do something says, oh, this is a step too far or not my competence, and then, then you're left with nothing, and then you have to go search again. Um, or you have to have your own funding for it, and that's also not always easy to find. Sometimes you find it, sometimes they like your project, but very often you already have to build something that works more or less, and then to convince people uh, that they will fund you. We have the anatomy tool, that's a real whole website that was funded by SURF over several yeah. years, so in the Netherlands. And, and uh, when I look at the VR glasses or, or the VR um, material, the ICT, they, they do not have the expertise yet. Eh? So that's the problem. So who are we asking? And besides uh, some of the VR uh, application which you would like to develop are, are yeah, is, is very expensive. Eh? What you said about the ideal work, like the educational team, the media team, and the IT services team. The point is that the educational uh, team, uh, it's innovating and uh, it's uh, trying to change things as well. But normally in universities, the media team and the IT are services, like for general services. I mean, there's no innovation Mm -hmm. uh, because the people that are there, it's just only covering needs, current needs, that need, we need to manage the universities as they are, but not to innovate uh, and give support for innovation in education. So that the media is uh, basically for promotion of the university, to, to pick up new students and so on. It's not a media to help the professors to have better graphical designs in our teaching. I mean, so... Uh, the services you mentioned it do exist at the university, but that services for general management, not for teaching. What we need, and perhaps yes. this is the step forward, is to have, we have a service for quality and innovation at our university. And uh, they help us. And of course, things start to work when they get involved. Like I, I imagine with the VR glasses, if they decided to, to implement as a university, then we will we'll receive help from this uh, quality and innovation department. So what we need is people in this quality or innovation or whatever you want to call them department for in- innovative education and then have these media people with uh, ability to graphical design, but you also need people with ability to programming and but focusing on teaching innovation. I mean, it's not the general services. It's a uh, no, We're but I mean, that can that, also be, a, I'd say. that could be um, a collaboration between industry and, and university. But I think that's mainly where the, the bridge is needed the most, if I hear this. No. To, to find um, both the, the task force, so having the, the availability, but also the freedom to explore these kind of tools on one hand, right. um, with getting the funding, of course, and on the other, other side is finding the, the right partners to to pull this off. And if you cannot find this, I think um, Lab Buddy, I think, is also an industry, um, a third-party application. So if you cannot design it yourself, then you have to look at the industry, what it's doing. So therefore, you need a budget. Yeah, I was... I was going to say that yeah. so LabBuddy is nice, but also there, like Leo said in her case, but also in my case, I ended up changing it. And so also I noticed the students were just copying and I said, okay, I'm going to innovate what we have for the GLP practicals and, and change the questions a bit. So I create new questions, but just creating new questions as a teacher requires you to understand the tools and do a little bit of programming. And and we have support from LabBuddy, but we need to pay. We need to pay for so many hours that I spent. Of course, I can tell them, like, I want you to design this, this, and this type of question, and they do it for me. Um, I was lucky that I asked one of my colleagues. I said, okay, can you quickly explain me the basics of how to copy-paste and how to make simple questions? And then... You can spend easily a day. I spent days <laughs> because it was the first time I used it. So, yeah, it's for academia, it's always a budget issue. Like, 
is it too difficult? Yes. Then the educational department, we can ask, look, it's too difficult for me to design a whole new chapter, let's say, then they will give you some money to spend on it. But if it's simple of one or two additional questions, they prefer you to do it yourself. And yeah, then as a teacher, that's new skills you need to acquire. Yeah. Okay. I, I have just one more question for you guys here. We started this whole project, the Ralde project, with the, the idea of rethinking active learning and distance education. It's what the acronym stands for. And something that always stuck with me is like, hey, what if, for example, we get stuck in the same situation again as, as the COVID situation? There's another pandemic or there's something where we cannot access the, the labs and we have to really rely on these tools. Knowing what we know now, um, after having dealt with this, how would you adapt your teachings? How would you change the way that you've done things before with the tools that we have now? I have an ID. Every student should have a VR glasses and we log in and we are uh, virtual with each other, having lectures and um, uh, communicate with each other. Yeah, that's for me. That's it. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> because it's budget. having. But now one with the practical uh, aspect. <laughs> yeah, for the practicals. Yeah, first of all, rely back on the tools we have because such lockdowns usually occur all of a sudden. Of course, now we started designing a VR practical for cell culture and hopefully then we can use this whenever this would happen again so that we can rely a bit more on that. But I think it's always going to have a mix of yeah, you know, what they call blended learning. Eh? You can't just do everything digital. Of course, then it's going to go back to Zoom meetings if there's another pandemic. But I think the most important thing is to give them a variety of tools, a video, an interactive quiz, um, uh, an interactive response lecture where they can really engage with a group or uh, with uh, with a teacher. I think that's the most important that you still provide a mix like you do on sites that you still try to provide a mix of different learning experiences uh, during such a lockdown or, or yeah and I think you should work with small groups and, uh, and see them maybe more often online. I also think you do you need mixes. I know that we even thought about whether we cannot make a develop a DNA isolation method. They they exist that you can do at home. Um or find some practicals. I don't know where you let students uh, bake a cake or whatever, but let them also do some some practical things and discuss those and discuss the 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 chemical things that happen. So yeah, I agree. Variety of materials, more online meetings, maybe shorter, small groups, innovative ideas, how you can get, keep them engaged. Because I think our students suffered enormously from, from isolation. I hadn't realized that, but I, I see that still now that for some students, that was a huge issue. We have tools and there are many tools available, also commercially available, but free tools as well that we as teachers, we were not using because we're just using what we were creating ourselves or in collaboration with our uh, colleagues in the university. So this is one thing. Now we know that we have tools. We know that there are already tools available and then we can even create one. But it's true that during this period, it's not the moment of creating. It's better to use what we already have. And the second thing is what Leo said. I think the big deal with this thing is to fight isolation. So you can give them a, the best tool in the world if they feel isolated and the, if they don't, because when you are not optimistic, when you don't do not feel well, you cannot under, you cannot study. I mean, and uh, it doesn't matter how good is the teacher or how good is the materials. So I think that working in small groups and having contact with them, this is something that we did in our university because we have a lot of mentoring and during the COVID and the pandemics, we had a lot of mentoring and they asked us to uh, contact our uh, mentorees and uh, to be tutors of many of our students and to contact them more often. And this was the key point because they do not feel alone. They don't feel isolated. 
And I think that uh, this is one of the most important things if you are locked down yeah. is to keep contact with them in smaller groups so they have a name and a face and you are not giving a Zoom meeting for 200. So they are there in names and faces, but they need to feel that you are their teacher. And, and I mean, perhaps you have to do less things, but uh, more contact. Um, it's the other way around. I would say that what we you expect, not to giving tools to, to be autonomous, but uh, you need to check with them at some point. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our discussion on virtual reality and online practicals in education. Now, if you want to connect with our guests, please check out the podcast description. And don't forget to also listen to our other episodes on problem-based learning and teaching with video. Again, I want to remind you for more information on the whole RALDE project, you can go to RALDE.eu or you can visit our YouTube channel at The RALDE project. I hope to see you soon in one of our other episodes. See you there.